Hello again. In this video I'm going to talk about the standard of review in substantive review of administrative action. This is a topic we have already touched upon when we looked at privative clauses and rights of appeal. We saw that in the standard of review analysis, as it existed before Vavilov, if Parliament vested a power in an administrative body and protected it with a privative clause, this was taken as a strong indication that a reasonableness standard, or before Dunsmuir, a patent unreasonableness standard was appropriate. Vavilov, as you also know, changed this. By introducing a presumptions-based approach, the existence of a privative clause was rendered irrelevant to the choice of standard of review. Reasonableness is presumed to be the appropriate standard, whether or not Parliament hedged around the power with a privative clause. Conversely, we saw that the presence of a statutory right of appeal now gives rise to a presumption that correctness review is the appropriate standard. What I'm going to do in this video is place these two particular issues in their broader context. I'm going to talk about the broader aspects of the standard review of analysis, both before and after Vavilov. In the second and third pre-recorded lectures for this week, I will be talking about applying the reasonableness and correctness standards respectively. Until Vavilov, Dunsmuir was the leading case on determining the appropriate standard of review. And it is useful to start with what the majority in Dunsmuir saw as the problem with the state of the law as it then was. The judgment of the majority begins at paragraph one in portentous terms. It speaks of the troubling questions of the approach to be taken in judicial review of decisions of administrative tribunals. It goes on. The recent history of judicial review in Canada has been marked by ebbs and flows of deference, confounding tests and new words for old problems, but no solutions that provide real guidance for litigants, counsel, administrative decision makers or judicial review judges. In response to these challenges, Dunsmuir sought to simplify the approach to substantive review of administrative action in two ways. First, it reduced the number of standards from three to two. And secondly, it tried to simplify the test for determining when each standard would apply. I will talk about each of these in turn, but my emphasis will be on the second. How each of the two standards apply will be considered in more detail in the second and third video for this week. But I need to consider the question briefly here. Remember that the actual approach to the standard of review in Dunsmuir has been superseded by Vavilov, but we need to look at Dunsmuir both to understand the position from which the current position developed, and also to understand the reasons why there was an emerging consensus that the law had to change. The short version of this story is that the animating principle, as understood in Dunsmuir, is deference. In reasonableness review, the court will defer to the primary decision maker, the tribunal or the administrative agency. Reasonable review, as the majority put it, is a deferential standard animated by the principle that certain questions that come before administrative tribunals do not lend themselves to one specific particular result. Tribunals have a margin of appreciation within the range of acceptable and rational solutions. A court conducting a review for reasonableness inquires into the qualities that makes a decision reasonable, referring both to the process of articulating reasons and to outcomes. In correctness review, on the other hand, as the majority put it in Dunsmuir at paragraph 50, a reviewing court will not show deference to the decision maker's reasoning process. It will rather undertake its own analysis of the question. That analysis will bring the court to decide whether it agrees with the determination of the decision maker. If not, the court will substitute its own view and provide the correct answer. 
From the outset, the court must ask itself whether the tribunal's decision was correct. According to the majority in Dunsmuir, the following factors indicate that deference is appropriate and that a reasonableness standard of review should apply. First, a privative clause is a statutory direction from Parliament or a provincial legislature indicating the need for deference. Second, where the question is one of fact, discretion or policy, deference will usually apply. Questions that can be characterised as mixed fact and law should also be approached through the deferential reasonableness standard. Third, where the tribunal is interpreting its own statute, or statutes closely connected to its own statute, or where the administrative tribunal has developed particular expertise in the application of the law, for example in labour adjudication. On the other hand, the majority in Dunsmuir indicated that correctness review would be appropriate in the following situations. First, where a particular challenge to administrative action raises constitutional issues, for example in relation to federalism, as we saw in the case of Crevier. Second, Dunsmuir followed earlier case law in talking about true questions of jurisdiction or virus. As I discussed in the lecture on privative clauses, the language is intended to distinguish the more expansive approach that predominated pre-QP in which just about any question could be framed as one of jurisdiction if the judges wanted to intervene. Third, questions of general law continue to attract correctness review. A question of general law is defined as one that is both of central importance to the legal system as a whole and outside the adjudicator's specialised area of expertise. Finally, questions that relate to jurisdictional lines between two or more competing specialised tribunals, Dunsmuir confirmed, should be subject to correctness review. It is important to note that the majority in Dunsmuir did not envisage a standard of review analysis to be necessary in every case. Where existing case law already answered the question, it was not necessary to repeat the standard of review analysis. Having taken you through the revised approach in Dunsmuir, it is appropriate to pause and ask whether or how far the majority achieved its objective of simplifying the standard of review analysis and developing an approach that gives greater guidance to lower courts and others. I think what you might say is that Dunsmuir was a partial success. The reduction of the number of standards from three to two has generally been met with approval. Second, since Dunsmuir, the jurisprudence has evolved to recognise that reasonableness will be the applicable standard for most categories of questions on judicial review, including presumptively when a decision maker interprets its enabling statute. But in terms of a simpler standard of review analysis, that is, a simpler approach to determining which standard of review applies in a given situation, I think this is where Dunsmuir perhaps fell down. I will go into this in a bit more in the next pre-recorded lecture, but one of the dissenters in Dunsmuir, Justice Binney, was very critical of the majority for its attempt to finesse the standard of review analysis. He spoke of the need to establish some presumptive rules and, secondly, to get the parties away from arguing about the tests and back to arguing about the substantive merits of the case. Particularly in respect of the second of these, this is something that Dunsmuir failed to do by all accounts. This is where the story of Dunsmuir ends and the story of Vavilov begins. As the plurality in Vavilov put it at paragraph 7, it has become clear that Dunsmuir's promise of simplicity and predictability has not been fully realised. And so in Vavilov, the majority, and I will call them that even though it was technically a unanimous decision on the case at bar, 
The majority sought to revisit the issue of the standard of review analysis. Vavilov, in the words of the majority in paragraph one, sought to chart a new course forward, as well as provide additional guidance for reviewing courts to follow when conducting reasonableness review. I will go into this guidance and what it contains in the next video. For now, I want to consider how Vavilov rethought the standard of review analysis. As you now know, the revised framework for review of the merits of a decision in Vavilov starts with a presumption that the applicable standard of review is their standard of reasonableness. What this means, just to spell it out, is that the default position is reasonableness review, and this default position can only be departed from in certain prescribed circumstances. I will go into what these prescribed cir circumstances are later on in this video, but first I want to spell out some of the implications of the new approach. In particular, certain of the Dunsmuir factors are now, so it would seem, no longer re relevant to determining the standard of review. And I'm referring to two criteria in particular, namely the relative expertise of the primary decision maker and the presence of a privative clause. I will take each of these in turn. First, expertise. As I noted when I discussed Dunsmuir a few moments ago, I said that expertise was a factor indicating that deference was appropriate. Within the heading of expertise, I included where the tribunal was interpreting its own statute, or statutes closely connected to its own statute, as well as where the decision maker has acquired specialist expertise. Now, it is important to note that the law had not been static between Stunsmuir and Vavilov. What started as a contextual inquiry around the specific question on which the challenge was brought had evolved to the point where the reviewing court would simply accept that expertise inheres in the administrative body by virtue of the specialised function delegated to it by the legislature. So the position had become a bit like it is with privative clauses. Recall that in Dunsmuir, the majority described the privative clause as a statutory direction from parliament or a legislature indicating the need for deference. Its inclusion is, as the majority also put it, evidence of parliament or a legislature's intent that an administrative decision maker be given greater deference and that interference by reviewing courts be minimised. I hope you can see how the position with expertise had become quite similar. The very fact that Parliament or a legislature had delegated the matter to an administrative body had come to be treated as evidence that Parliament considered that body to be expert in that particular matter. But as a result of the new framework set out in Vavilov, consideration of these matters is unnecessary since the presumption of reasonableness review automatically applies, unless it is rebutted, of course, which I am getting to. Here's how the majority put it in Vavilov. While specialised expertise and these other rationales may all be reasons for a legislature to delegate decision-making authority, a reviewing court need not evaluate which of these rationales apply in the case of a particular decision-maker in order to determine the standard of review. Instead, in our view, it is the very fact that the legislature has chosen to delegate authority which justifies a default position of reasonableness review. And just to make sure that there is no doubt in what the Supreme Court of Canada is saying, the majority adds at paragraph 31, we wish to emphasise that because these reasons adopt a presumption of reasonableness as the starting point, expertise is no longer relevant to a determination of the standard review as it was in the contextual analysis. However, we are not doing away with the role of expertise in administrative decision making. The consideration is simply folded into the new starting point, and as explained below, expertise remains a relevant consideration in conducting reasonableness review.
So the point the Supreme Court of Canada has now got to would seem to be that expertise and related factors provide a reason why Parliament or a legislature might want to delegate powers to an administrative body and have matters arising determined by an administrative body rather than a court. This is no longer a matter that a reviewing court has to take into consideration. It just has to consider the statutory scheme. I hope this is clear, but I also hope that you're starting to see that this is a return to a more formalist approach, albeit in a very different way to the pre-pragmatic and functional era. You should now pause the video and read paragraphs 23 to 32 of Vavilov. Now that you have read paragraphs 23 to 32, I will turn to how the presumption of reasonableness can be rebutted. At paragraph 17 of Vavilov, the court sets out the circumstances in which the presumption of reasonableness can be rebutted. There are two broad classes of situation. One is where the legislature has indicated that it intends that a different standard or set of standards should apply. This, as we shall see in a moment, is further broken down into two categories, but the second type of situation is where the rule of law requires a standard of correctness to be applied. I will talk about each of these situations in turn, but first it would be useful to pause this video and read paragraph 17 of Vavilov. Now that you have read paragraph 17 of Favilov, I will proceed to talk about the first class of situation, where the legislature directs a different standard or standards of review. The majority in Favilov claims to put legislative intent at the heart of its new approach to determining the standard of review. The presumption of reasonableness, as the court puts it at paragraph 33, is intended to give effect to the legislature's choice to leave certain matters with administrative decision makers rather than the courts. It is perhaps natural, therefore, that the principal way in which the presumption can be rebutted is where a legislative direction to apply a correctness standard can be inferred. The majority identifies two ways in which a legislature can do this. The first, which isn't particularly controversial, is that the legislature might explicitly prescribe in an administrative statute the standard of review that should apply in a particular context. The second situation, which is in fact hugely controversial as we will see, is where the legislature provides a right of appeal in an administrative statute. Again, I will discuss each of these in turn. The first situation, which is discussed in paragraphs 34 to 35 of the judgment, is where the legislature might direct the standard of review, and this is uncontroversially, where it explicitly directs that a specific standard or standard should apply. The most common situation is, of course, where provinces have passed general procedural statutes, such as Ontario's Statutory Powers Procedure Act, although the specification of the standard can also be found in the enabling statute itself. This brings us to a second and much more controversial aspect of Vavilov, which I shall now discuss. The second situation, as far as legislative direction is concerned, is where the statute provides an appeal mechanism. In fact, you have already heard about this from the pre-recorded lecture last week on statutory rights of appeal. But just to recap, the position post Vavilov is that where a statute provides a right of appeal, then a correctness standard applies. Rather than repeat myself, you should go back at a convenient moment and repeat what I said about statutory rights of appeal and their effect on the standard of review. The important point for now is that the majority in Vavilov sought to situate this rule within the broader idea 
that legislative intent is the lodestar that guides the approach of the courts in judicial review. But whether it is really the case that Parliament or provincial legislatures intended a correctness standard when they legislate an appeal mechanism may be debatable. I will now turn to the second class of situation where the courts will now apply a standard of correctness, and that is where the rule of law requires it. The presumption of reasonableness may be overturned, according to the majority, where the rule of law requires it. This is emphatically not a catch-all category, but encompasses a number of carefully defined situations. I will list them and discuss each of them in turn. These are constitutional questions, general questions of law of central importance to the legal system as a whole, and questions regarding the jurisdictional boundaries between two or more administrative bodies. Constitutional questions will attract a correctness standard of review. As the majority put it in the decision at paragraph 55, questions regarding the division of power between Parliament and the provinces, the relationship between the legislature and other branches of the state, the scope of Aboriginal and treaty rights under section 35 of the Constitution Act 1982, and other constitutional matters right, require a final and determinate answer from the courts. We saw an example of this early on in the module when we considered the case of Crevier. Note that the position in Vavilov that constitutional questions require a standard of correctness review is consistent with the decision in Dunsmuir. In holding that questions of central importance to the legal system as a whole will attract a standard of correctness review, the court is again following quite closely the principle set out in Dunsmuir. There is, however, one important difference. While Dunsmuir spoke of questions which are both of central importance to the legal system as a whole and outside the adjudicator's specialised area of expertise, in Vavilov, the court drops the second part of that and looks only at questions of central importance to the legal system as a whole. In justifying this move, the majority in Vavilov noted that the underlying justification in Dunsmuir for corrective this review in this situation is the need for uniform and consistent answers, and this, the majority felt, required that a correctness review was provided by the court. As the majority put it at paragraph 62, general questions of law of central importance to the legal system as a whole require a single determinate answer. In cases involving such questions, the rule of law requires that courts provide a greater degree of legal certainty than reasonableness review allows. Finally, the majority in Vavilov considered that questions regarding the jurisdictional boundaries between two or more administrative bodies required correctness review. Disputes of this nature are rare, but attract correctness review because, as the court puts it at paragraph 64, the rule of law cannot tolerate conflicting orders and proceedings where they result in a true operational conflict between two administrative bodies, pulling a party in two different and incompatible directions. So the Supreme Court of Canada has specified a strict set of situations in which the presumption that judicial review will be performed according to a reasonableness standard of review can be overturned. One final question is whether these categories are exhaustive. That is, is, th is this it, or is it possible that the court or lower courts will in future create or discover situations where the rule of law or the intention of Parliament requires correctness review? The answer is that the Supreme Court of Canada left the door open, but only by a crack. As the majority put it, we would not definitely foreclose the possibility that another category could be recognised as requiring a derogation from the presumption of reasonableness review in a future case. 
but it adds, the recognition of any new basis for correctness review would be exceptional and would need to be consistent with the framework and the overarching principles set out in these reasons. In other words, while the door is not closed fully, the Supreme Court of Canada is discouraging lower courts from engaging in a search for new ways to justify a departure from the presumption that agency decisions will be reviewed according to a reasonableness standard. I hope you have enjoyed this video. I will look at the guidance given by the court on performing reasonableness review in the next video. For now, goodbye.